Tourette's podcast is not a medical advice show. It's a show about experiences. In the course of that, we may talk about medications or therapies or stories from the doctor's office, but don't mistake any of that for medical advice or direction. It's not. Get that only from people or places licensed or certified to give it. Not from a massively fun and action-packed podcast about our life experiences. Such as... He was um, watching a TED Talk, and he said there's a lady with Tourette, and she was finding like she's got the things I've got. And I was like, really? So I watched it. And I thought, oh, maybe it is this. So um, I was looking for like audio books and podcasts and you come up and I gave it a listen. And I think I listened to about eight episodes back to back on the same day. And I was like, wow, I know this is what I've got. This is Tourette's podcast, made possible with support of the Tourette Association of America and part of the Geeks Rising Network. Hey, it's Ben. This is episode 14 of season 6, which is nuts. Because that gives us two more episodes after this one to round out the season. 16 episodes in all, 17 if you count the bonus episode I put up this past week. By request, a bonus episode of my remarks and interactions at the 2021 Virtual Teen Summit. That was a lot of fun. That's at Tourette'sPodcast.com. And it should have also hit whatever podcast app you use, as well as Spotify. Since we're not quite at but near the end of the season, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what was good, what was lacking, what you want more of or less of or different or new. In saying that, I always have to remind with it and hope it doesn't sound like a cop out that it's just me doing the podcast and Sophia doing the discussion group. So it's hard to honor big transformative ideas that would require like a staff and multiple producers and so on. Although there is a really great support team, people who were there to help me answer questions that I'm not expert enough to answer myself, or include me in productions that I couldn't pull off myself, like the Teen Summit. That was done by the Tourette Association, that was a lot of fun to take part in. U.S. residents, don't forget the Virtual National Advocacy Day. It's coming up on March 3rd, which sounds like it's out into the future, but there are some mandatory things you gotta do in preparation for that that are coming right up. For instance, there's a, there's a mandatory training session, February 10th, to learn about the priority issues and key talking points. The Virtual Advocacy Day is an event where the Tourette Association of America is setting you up for virtual meetings with your U.S. representatives and senators. Gonna read you a quote from a youth ambassador, a Tourette Association youth ambassador named Jacob. Quote, Meeting with members of Congress and their staff puts the reality of our situation directly in front of those from whom we are asking for support. It is one thing to hear about the effects Tourette syndrome has, and a whole other thing to see the effects up close. It puts a face to the statistic. Statistics can do a lot, but nothing is better than a person sharing their story. End quote. A statement I obviously agree with. Virtual Advocacy Day. I'll have a link in the bio with this episode at Tourette'sPodcast.com. Or you can find it at Tourette.org and click Attend an Event. Some other events coming right up on February 2nd, Managing Coprolalia in the community, at school, and in college. On February 10th, Managing OCD and Anxiety in school. And on February 11th, it's TAA Trivia Night. And there's a lot more, including a Team Tourette t-shirt design contest for the many Tourette creatives out there. You can learn more about this at Tourette.org. Click Attend an Event. The Tourette Association of America is the primary sponsor of Tourette's podcast, really making it possible. Along with support from people like you and scholastic support, scholastic, emphasis on the tick, scholastic support providing scholarships to students with Tourette syndrome, and they're taking applications now. I believe they have five scholarships available at $2,500 each. Head to scholasticsupport.org, that's S-C-O-L-A-S-T-I-C, S-U-P-P-O-R-T dot org, scholasticsupport dot org. The applications are online there. You'll see the link for the applicant page. Of course, I will also link to it with this episode of Tourette's Podcast at Tourette'sPodcast.com. Scholastic Support is Guide Star rated, and they have a platinum rating, meaning they've been totally fiscally transparent, so you know they're legit. And if you'd like to support this cause, contact them. They can always use your support to help students with Tourette scholasticsupport.org. And a personal shout out to Janine, the president of Scholastic Tourette Supporters, who I got to meet in Los Angeles a while back, and she was as warm in person as I would have imagined. 
It was actually at the uh, the special screening of Motherless Brooklyn with Ed Norton. I met a lot of people there. Anyway, check them out and give your support at scholasticsupport.org. Scholarships for students with Tourette syndrome. I want to thank new members at the Tourette's Podcast Discussion Group on Facebook: Alexis, Dave, Tammy, Greta May, Dave, another Dave, David, a third. Did any of you ever used to watch Kids in the Hall or Bruce McCullough, like the These Are the Days I Know, I Know? Eh, sorry, <laughs> that just popped in my head. A whole song about people named Dave. Anyway, Daniel, and if I'm pronouncing the name right, me, Keat. Apologies if I got that wrong. Thank you for joining the hundreds and hundreds of people who are part of the Tretz Podcast discussion group, and thanks as always to Sophia for keeping that going so well. Quick question here from the listener mailbag before we get to the conversation. By the way, this week it's with a Toretter in London who cuts hair for a living, which brings to mind all the usual questions. And it gets really interesting. Um, but this question comes from Thomas. And this one's great because I, I think about this question a lot. Thomas asks, Does colored lighting affect your mood? I bought a set of light bulbs of different colors for my room, and each color makes me feel a different way. Is there anything to it? Thanks, Thomas. And yeah, I assume there is. I figure there have to be studies on the books about this. And I'll ask the science friends of the podcast what they know about it. But just speaking for myself, I do this. I have different colored lights in almost every room. I have a deep red light in the, one of the bathrooms, and I have a red light in my bedroom. There's a green light in my studio. There's a lavender colored light in one of the hallways. There's an amber colored light in another part of the studio, and they definitely affect my mood. One light color I can't do is this shade of blue. Kind of like a powerful blue because this is going to sound weird. It makes me feel lonely which sounds really weird to say. The shade of blue just makes me feel lonely and kind of anxious. Red light makes me feel almost detached from reality in sort of a comforting and safe way. Like I feel different the moment I walk into it. Again, in kind of a good way. Green light makes me feel really focused. I don't know if it's because green feels kind of like a sciency kind of color, and it's just that association, but I feel really focused when I'm in the studio with the green light. I don't know what the amber light does, But that's a cool question about, you know, what there is to it. Again, I don't know, and I don't want to read anything off Google here because I don't want to communicate anything bogus. I'll ask the uh, the science folks if they know anything off the top of their heads. And I'll ask you guys if you related to any of this stuff or get completely different feelings than what I just described. Thomas, you too. I wrote you back. But if you relate to this, I'd love to know. Do different colors of light make you feel something different? Okay, so let's bring up the conversation this week. It's a great one. It's fun and freewheeling. We're talking with Becky, a barber and creative from London. She plays Tourette's podcast in her barber shop, which actually starts conversations, which is awesome. She also has a company separately called Jim Jams Resin, which sells um this is not sponsored content by the way. This is just me telling you about Becky and what she does. Jim Jams Resin sells objects that Becky makes out of resin. You know, like sort of that like hardened clear acrylic in different colors like like domino sets, ashtrays, keychains, figurines, Ouija boards or Ouija boards depending on how you pronounce it. I got a set of coasters from her, including a personalized Tourette coaster, which my Geeks Rising coffee mug is sitting on right now. It sounds like I'm doing all kinds of product placement. Anyway, she's a maker and we talk all about that. There was a little audio connection glitch toward the end that interfered a little bit. So I tried to tighten things up in the editing process. It's nothing big, just pointing it out because we had to reconnect a couple times. Just a small thing. Overall, this one's really fun and we hit a lot of subjects, including Becky's atypical experience and discovery of Tourette syndrome. So here's me and Becky. Okay, I'm Becky. I'm from London slash Bournemouth. Um, I'm a barber and a mum, and at the moment I'm a quarantine mum. <laughs> the marriage too. I, I've uh, got to congratulate you on that publicly. I think I already have, but I'll say it again. Yeah, thank you. It's been one month today. That's awesome. Yeah, congrats. I uh, I saw the photos. They they looked awesome. It looked like a really cool party. Oh, thanks. We've been, I guess, talking on social media for <laughs> a good while, like maybe a year, a couple of years, or something, and. Yeah, you know, it's a fascination point. I think anytime anybody in the Trek community 
has an occupation that, you know, kind of involves precision and it, you being a barber, I mean, does ticking get in the way with that? Or is it kind of the thing where you get into the zone and it doesn't bother you? Or that I think that's the curiosity. It doesn't even happen when I'm cutting hair normally. It's in between haircuts it does. Huh. D- it- Something happens. As soon as I start cutting hair, it's fine. I've, well, I've flipped the scissors what nearly poked someone in the ear before. <laughs> but um, that's about it. <laughs> um, was that a concern for you? <laughs> Uh, I mean, what, what drew you into barber or into uh, doing any kind of work with hair if Tourette was a factor in your life? Do you know what? I've had so many different jobs and I don't keep them for long. Not because I'm unemployable. It's just because I never find something that I like or nothing what keeps me interested. Yeah. So I've done all sorts. I'm not an office sort of person. Definitely not. I'm more of a practical person. Yeah. Yeah. My husband had a barber shop. And I just thought, oh, why don't I just do that? So I've done barber training, and here I am. Now it's my shop. <laughs> How long have you been doing it? Um, well, now I'm qualified. It's been, well, since last year. I was just doing some haircuts before that, but I was doing other jobs as well. So I'm still new to barbering. Do you find that it aligns with uh creativity in you because i mean i I know you're also a creative Uh, is is there an angle to that when it comes to cutting hair i think so it's because i really enjoy it and i would say i'm a perfectionist but i always find problems with my haircut sometimes Hmm. so um i just really like concentrating on it i can concentrate on a haircut most other things i can't concentrate on so i just really enjoy it and i like the fact that i can talk to people yeah so yeah, it's perfect. Do, do you play the podcast in your barbershop? Did did you you told me that? I do. Me. Yeah, I do. <laughs> That's cool. When it's not so busy, when it's really busy and people are talking, I end up getting like I have to pause it and I'm like, excuse me. Yeah. So when it's a bit more quieter and there's only a couple of us in there, I play it. Does anybody ever ask like what the tie-in is with that and your life or why that's an interest point for you? I mean, do, do people know that you? Yeah, yeah. That? We've had talks, and I've had a guy who actually you come in and he said when are you going to um, put this radio on again? <laughs> so he said, oh, let him know so he can come. And I told him, you can just get it on your podcast app. <laughs> That's so cool. But it's interesting. People do ask about it. What do what do people seem to know? Uh, I mean, do, do, is it the kind of thing where people just sort of approach it as, uh, uh, you know, the, there are the stereotypes and all that. And then there's, you know, the the genuine curiosity that can come with, you know, learning something new that you didn't know before. I mean, what do, how do people seem to regard it when they have conversations well, it's with a you? Quite a, sorry, I keep cutting you in. No, go for it. Yeah, it's an education because it is the stereotype thing because people are like, oh, they're not swearing. It's the same old thing you see on TV. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, it's not just that. Yeah. So when I just tell them a little bit and then they listen as well. And yeah, it's an education for them. Do people seem surprised? I mean, because, you know, a a lot of cases people say things like, uh, oh, yeah, I I had no idea, which I think was the title of the first episode of Tourette's podcast was, you know, oh, I had no idea, you know, and uh, and yeah, I hear that. And oh, you don't look disabled. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm actually not. Yeah. I I mean, so is this something that, you know, different people we talked to were diagnosed at different points in their life or maybe it started early and they were diagnosed later or what's your your story with coming to know Tourette? Uh, thanks for asking. Well, I got diagnosed this year and I didn't even know that I had Tourette. I did, well, I had an idea when I was younger. But I, well, let me start from the beginning. Yeah. I've had tics all my life, vocal mainly and some movement tics and so on. And I've always got called them habits or just my thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, was it about two, three years ago, we was watching, me and my partner, my husband now, we was watching some video and said something about Tourette. And I thought, that can't be. (laughs) So I think last year, no, the year was, what year was it, 2018? He was um, watching a TED Talks. And he said, there's a lady with Tourette's and she was sounding like she's got the things I've got. Hmm. 
And I was like, really? So I watched it and I thought, oh, maybe it is this. So um, I've just randomly thought, what do I, how do I find out about Tourette? Hmm. So um, I was looking for like audio books and podcasts and you come up and I gave it a listen. And I think I listened to about eight episodes back to back on the same day. And I was like, wow, huh. I know this is what I've got. So I've started since then just doing research and stalking people who come on your um, <laughs> episodes on the show. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let me see this person. Yeah. Wow. That, that's, I mean. So I pushed to get diagnosed this year because I've been trying to find out from my doctors for the last however long, just what is wrong with me? Why do I do this? Yeah. Because it's never, ever bothered me. Uh, obviously, there's been situations that have bothered me, but it's just been me. But I wanted to know what it is because no one else I know does this. It's it's amazing how so many like I I hear that story a lot about you know th- someone's just sitting on the couch with their partner and they're watching something on TV and you know th- there's a mm-hmm. lot of complaints about how it's portrayed on TV, but there it's it's there's still like something in it and maybe it's in the subtleties or something like that, but you see someone who just, just kind of reflects you and, yeah. and that kind of starts you on the quest and then you go out and you get the diagnosis and, you know, it, it's, um, it, you know, it becomes an answer, but you know, it, it's also kind of a new door that opens up. I mean, was that exciting to you or was that anxious or, you know, it, it can be scary it or, good. It was a bit. It was a bit of um, a bit of sweet. I was happy because I thought now I know what's up with me. So there's a name for it, and I'm not just this glitch, you know. Mm-hmm. But then it's a bit sad because I'm like, so now all these things I thought I knew about myself. That's not me. That's not my personality. It's just threat. And without it, I should be bland. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you, you do have it though, you know, it, it, it is, um, even though Tourette is not your identity, you know, it definitely figures into the, the person you are and, yeah, you know, and I, I've only kind of known you from afar, but I mean, you, you do a lot of the, the, you know, you're a maker and the creative angle of the brain, I think definitely kind of pops forward with, um, just, just things yeah. you make. And, uh, I, I posted something in my, uh, Instagram stories about the coasters yeah. that you sent over. So you make these resin objects and i love it it's awesome and it's kind of made me interested in doing something like that because i feel like it would just be kind of a nice kind of satisfying process to you know once it's dried it's and nice ready to do something you know yeah i just yeah i just get bored so it's something that keeps me busy that, that that's the way i am i mean even as we're talking right now i have like a little usb drive in my hand that i'm just kind of like you know twittering with and Oh, I've got a bottle in my left hand. I'm just <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like I always have to have a toy. A water bottle, not alcohol. Right, right. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I always have to have something or like three or four things going on in front of me at all times, even if I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be editing photos. And so so I'll go on my photo walks and I'll have my camera with me. I'll be listening to something like a podcast or something like that. I'm mm-hmm. playing with my camera even when I'm not taking a picture. I'm like, you know, like spinning the knobs or something. Then I take the photo and it's just like, it has to be this sort of broad sensory experience. Then I come home, I transfer the photos onto my computer. I start editing. I have to have something on in the background. It can even be chaotic, like someone talking, something I'm supposed to be listening to news or something like that. But I just, I really have to flood my own senses to really be satisfied. And as soon as I saw the the things you were making with resin just yeah like like just waiting for it to dry and popping it out of the mold or something it just that definitely feels like something i would love to do just as an experience yeah you should you should definitely do it i used to do some photography but unlike you i don't like editing it's just so long i don't have the patience right so i just take pictures and they just stay on the memory card yeah i um the, the editing is like the dessert for me where, you know, I, I enjoy the process of kind of being out and I love, you know, being in a developed environment and framing up things and, you know, raising the camera to my eye and everything disappears except for what I see in that square. And there's a really just therapeutic angle to all of that. Cause I, 
you know, it's, it's like I frame up my world. I, oh, yeah. I compose it and, you know, it's like, it's fun. And then I get home and then it's like, okay, you know, what can I do with these? And so that's why I, I kind of equate it to like dessert where it's just, for me, it's like this enjoyable process of, um, of just kind of making the image exactly what I want to see in my head and aligning what's on the screen to the vision I have in my head. But photography is definitely your thing. Yeah, yeah, it's my thing. I just, you know, but I, have you have you always been a creative? I think so. I don't want to give myself too much glory. I used to be able to draw, but I just don't have any inspiration anymore. I know that sounds really sad, but um, yeah, I used to be able to draw. I used to make little clay figurines, but um, not anymore because I get bored. Yeah. So I don't know how long this resin hobby is going to last for because I just build into things and then yeah. after a couple of months, I'm like, what's next? That resonates with me because I think when I first started doing photography as like a thing, like I, I had always kind of done it and I did it in the course of my job, which was uh, journalism. And But when I adopted it as like this is going to be my chief passion i was kind of wondering if it was going to flame out after a short period of time because i definitely go full bore into all these little things that i get interested in anything that has uh, a youtube presence or um maybe some community aspect to it i just go full on into it and when you mentioned drawing that's what i thought my career was going to be at one point i thought it was going to be like a you know like a visual artist or a painter and I just flamed yeah. out with it. Like I, I was having a blast with it so much that I thought it was going to be my life. And then I just transitioned into something else, um, recording music and getting into audio and podcasting and then, you know, and then photography. And uh, I'm, uh-huh. I definitely feel that because I, things don't hold my attention when they have my attention. I'm all over it. But when it starts to kind of wane off or I find something else new, I just dive headfirst into that next thing. And I wave by. Yeah, me the... too. I invest all my money into everything. Yeah. Like before I was doing, well, not doing tattooing because I wasn't a tattooist. I just thought, okay, I'll buy my tattoo kit. I'll buy a bunch of inks, some transfer paper. I'll buy all of this, a printer to <laughs> print out the transfer stencils. Yeah. And then I've done a bunch of tattoos on my leg and done with some of my friends. And I thought, all right, this is boring now. <laughs> What's next? Yeah. So I went and bought all these different paints and canvases and then I was like, nah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think about that too, like the finances of it, because when I'm on the, the the sort of beginning end of this where I'm like, okay, well, I know at some point I'm going to want to do this and there's a good price on it. So I'm going to go ahead and buy this thing. And, you know, whether it's like a lens for the camera or like, and if I get okay. that, I'm going to need this thing too. And, and I just kind of develop a whole universe for myself of, you know, <laughs> I have everything I need who knows you know if i ever get to it because of because of the way my attention works and but it's good it comes in handy you know absolutely yeah you definitely become like a sort of a jack of all trades uh-huh. <laughs> so so you're a mom and you got some really adorable kids um oh, thank you is has Tourette or anything like that shown up in i guess elsewhere in your family or have you seen anything in your kids uh, my daughter i don't know um I was speaking to my um, neurologist, I think, last month, and he was asking about my children, and I said, oh, she's just, like, the same as me, Hmm. just that her personality and everything. And he's like, yeah, it definitely sounds like she's got age. But but recently, I've been hearing her making throat clearing noises and just a little... "Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm." Hmm. And I said to her dad, I said, I think she's getting vocal tics. He's like, no, why are you trying to wish it on her? (laughs) And I said, I'm not trying to wish it on her. I'm just noticing things. Yeah. Like, no, she's never done it before. And I said, but you don't, you're not born with ticks. It just happens. Yeah. And he's, he's in denial. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm just waiting. If it happens, if it, if it is, he will notice eventually. And it doesn't make no difference to me. But yeah, I think she's starting vocal ticks. Well, I'm, I know she's getting some vocal ticks. Well, I mean, if it does happen, you know, she's in a really good position to have you as a mom who gets it and the mystery isn't going to be, you know, something that, um, you know, like in your case, you, you had wondered what it was, you know, for the majority of your life. And then the answer kind of comes, you know, but it, it, it in your case, the answer just kind of, you know, it, it, it was almost like a, a chance occurrence that you learned about it and then you followed it up. 
um, you know, in, in her case, you know, it's, it's something where, you know, she can have that support. Yeah. You know, the, the infrastructure is there, which is a huge advantage to have. Mm -hmm. Were you roughly her age when you started showing ticks or w when did that start up for yeah, you? Yeah, I was about, I was, yeah, she's seven. I was about six or seven. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I don't even actually, I don't, well, I say I was about six or seven. I don't even remember when it started, but I do remember getting in trouble when I was about that age for saying hello to random people. <laughs> As like a compulsion type thing, or was it a was hello just a tick? Or um, I'm I'm not actually sure. I remember just saying hello, and then someone else would walk past, and I keep saying hello, hello. Yeah. And my stepmom said, "Why do you keep saying that?" I said, "I don't know." And she's like, "Don't do it again." I said, "I won't." And then I said, "Hello," and she's like, "What are you doing?" I said, "I can't help it." Yeah. She's like, "You can help it." And then I was like, "No, I won't." And I won't. I won't do it again. And then I said, "Hello," and then I got smack, and I thought, "Oh." Yeah, I. But, I. I I have things like that. Home, she was like, why did you keep doing that? I said, I can't help it. She's like, of course you can. <laughs> and then she, she said, I was hissing as well. Like, going, and she was like, she noticed it before my dad did, actually. And she was like, why do you keep doing that? And I said, like, I can't help it. I keep telling you, you're not listening to me. Like hissing like then, a cat? That's, um, just like a little like, snake hiss. Oh, yeah. I, I many different things. They just change over time, but... She, my stepmom, she noticed it before everyone else did. Um, hmm. Yeah, since then, I didn't get in trouble with her, just my dad. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you watched the, the show um, on Tourette. I mean, how familiar were, were you with it beforehand? You know, a lot of people have, like, they know it by name and they might know the stereotype, but not much else. Like, where were you at before that? Um, what with, well, with myself, I just thought it's habit. I did go to the doctor with my dad and they said um, she might have a tick disorder or it could be to it. And he's like, no, nah, there's nothing wrong with her. Um, she's probably just naughty and stressed. And they said, um, we can t um, send it, refer her to someone. He was like, no, nah, there's nothing wrong with her. And it was left as that until adulthood. Yeah. And to it, I just thought the same as everyone else who doesn't know much. I just thought, Ah, it's people who just swear because they can't help it. And that's all I thought it was. Yeah. I, I didn't know that Tourette was not just coprolalia. Is that how you say it? Yeah, coprolalia. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I had no idea until recently. Well, it's good that it, it doesn't, you know, I, I think you said it doesn't bother you um, in your life. I mean, you know, it's... I mean, are, are there any painful ticks or anything like that that have come and gone? Or is this something that's fairly benign uh, in your life in terms of being able to manage it? Um, I do get pain. Like my neck, it gets sore and stiff sometimes. My fingers, I do some weird things, mainly when I'm driving. Um, and sometimes it just makes my knuckles and my fingers hurt. But um, mm -hmm. not really painful. Everything else is fine. Obviously, I used to clamp my teeth down and slam, I'd smash my teeth. Mm -hmm. So I've chipped my teeth a lot over the years because of it. What is actually painful on my jaw when I clench my jaw. Yeah. But um, luckily, I've not had any self-harming tics where I've hurt myself. So, I mean, does that mean you're, um, are, are you taking any medication to manage it? Or is this something that you're just kind of dealing with on your own? No, no medication. Um I do smoke the herbs sometimes in the evening mm -hmm. just to relax myself. Otherwise I can just be like wired up. Yeah. It, it's, um, I've, I've heard from more and more people who do the same thing too. You know, in, in a lot of cases, depending on what state they live in, in the United States, um, you know, it's, it's still illegal in a lot of parts of the country, but, but the people I've talked to who have a prescription for it, there may be a specific strain or something that they're getting, but I mean, they report the the same thing. It's very relaxing to them. And, um, and we did an episode a little while back, kind of looking at the science of it and, you know, what, what, what are the advantages to, uh, to ticking or to Tourette and manage it? And I think a lot of it is just the relaxation you get out of it, it puts you in a place where, yeah. you know, the, I guess in my case, when I'm anxious or when I'm overstimulated, that's when the ticks really start to come out. And mm -hmm. you know, otherwise, you know, when I'm 
uh, in a fairly docile mood. You know, I, I may have like small ticks here and there, but I'm in the frame of mind where it's not really bothering me. The anxiety is not really there. Mm-hmm. I assume that's the connection and the benefit for Tourette. I, I think there's more science that needs to be done, but it is a strange mystery. Yeah. So have you, um, you know, you, you mentioned kind of binging the, the podcast. I mean, what were some of the revelations for you that you really, you know, kind of connected with uh, in terms of just kind of like, oh my God, this lines up with this other person's story? Just like some of the things, I don't know. I can't, I, my memory is really bad, but... Um, Mine too. I can't explain. Um, just different things. Like when you said about your, is it, was it you? Is that a stomach clenching tick? Yeah, I do that. Clenching your... I didn't know that was a tick. I, I I did something like this. I didn't know that. I just thought it's just something I do. I did not know. Even until this last year, I didn't know that it was something to do with it. I just thought, just my ways. Yeah. I just thought my ticks, my focal ticks, was it, even though I've done other things, but I just thought that's just normal and it's just my focal ticks were the problem. Because people don't really notice when I do other things. They just notice the vocal tips. And I said to my brother, I said, before I got diagnosed, I said, I think I know what I've got. I think I've got Tourette. He's like, no, you haven't. I said, yeah, I have. And he goes, no, you haven't. And I said, I, I think I know. Because I've been listening to this podcast. And he's like, oh, look at you, self-diagnosing. And he's like, you don't do anything else. All you do is make silly noises because you're a weirdo. And I was like, no, um, I do... um." this and that and he goes no you don't I said I do and he goes no that's just because you're like you're stretching your neck I'm like no and just and yeah it's, it's weird because sometimes I'm like do you recognise when I do this and people are like no nah. yeah so no oh, okay some people don't recognise people it's weird because you think people who are closest to you notice more it's normally me people who don't know me mm-hmm. like if I'm on a bus or in a supermarket I do something, I notice people just like have a look. Yeah, and I'm like, ah, you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, d- does it bother you uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the social piece and what people pick up on you? It used to. No, well, actually, most of the time, I never really cared before when I was growing up because I just thought, oh, it's just me. I don't actually care, <laughs> and that was just it. And then I think I got a bit more self conscious in my twenties. So I think, oh my God, someone's looking at me. Yeah. And now, now I know, oh, okay, I'm not a weirdo. This is just it. So now I'm just like, oh, whatever. But sometimes, like most of the time, I just laugh it off. Or it's, sometimes it can be funny because I think, oh, <laughs> you know. Right. But other times, I'm just like, oh, this is so awkward. What about growing up? I mean, was there, even, even if you did kind of, uh, I guess, accept yourself in terms of like, this is just me and what I do. I mean, were there any times growing up where you had to explain it to friends or other adults or anything like that? You know that? what? In my school, I had the most terrible time. Um, yeah, it was really not good. Hmm. The teachers, I think I put um, a post up on the Facebook thing about it. The teacher, he told me to come out of class because my face is inappropriate. And hmm. He was just really, and I said, I can't help it. And he said, why are you putting faces? I said, I can't help it. And he's like, your face is inappropriate. I don't like it. And everyone would look at me and start laughing. And I thought, oh, that's not funny. Yeah, that, that's... And I've been removed from the class for making noises because the teacher thought I was, like, mocking him and mocking the class and disrupting the class. So things like that was annoying. I'm like, I can't help it. I can't help it. Yeah. And they actually just thought... Uh, because obviously I had ADHD as well. They'd thought, oh, she's been naughty, she's attention seeking. And then I'll go home and my dad will say, you're attention seeking. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. whatever. Yeah. That... But apart from that, the getting in trouble what, um, bothered me. But apart from that, what people thought, I really, really didn't care. I thought, I don't give, you know, if you like me or not. W- were there other things that came along with? Tourette that you know like with me just the ADHD was so bad you know like uh just learning even if I didn't tick the learning environment for me was just such a disaster um in terms of me paying attention or being able to follow along uh sleep and all that stuff yeah the attention uh, no I I wasn't really I was a naughty kid as well to be honest and I don't blame Mm. it all on the ADHD I was just a rebel I think because my dad was so strict I just thought I'd do what I want anyway yeah um so learning in class 
if it's do you, I used to actually bunk off schools when it got to secondary school I used to just disappear and go about my business and just come to the lessons I liked so I used to show up every week for drama and art mm-hmm. and and then just go home or go to my friend's house for the rest of the week yeah yeah I I, I definitely identify with the rebel part because I mean yeah I, I acted up a lot and um a lot of it I think was and I don't think I thought about this in this way at the time. But I think looking back, I just wanted to deny anybody the privilege of being able to um, order me around or define me. I, I, I think mm-hmm. anytime someone was, you know, you stop doing that. I just knowing what I had, knowing the involuntary aspect and all that. I don't, I wasn't working like Tourette into it, but anytime uh, I, I just didn't like being in a position where, mm-hmm. uh, especially with other adults where, I think they thought they had some kind of say over me and I was going to show them that they didn't like that. That was kind of my attitude. Yeah. It's stressful as well. The expectation, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, it it was definitely a bad stressor of, you know, performing a certain way. Um, I remember because it took me a longer time to, um, to kind of get there, you know, like when I was younger, my other classmates, they could figure out the math problem quickly and me, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't get there. And yeah, um, I'm, I'm the same. I'm terrible at math even till today. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm useless just with it. Just the way they, my brain is just different to everyone else. And I think that's what was stressful to me. So in the end, I just refused to do any work. I couldn't concentrate. I did not understand the way they were teaching because one way doesn't work for everyone. Right. And they didn't accommodate any other ways to learn for me. So I just thought, okay, I can't do it. My brain will have a meltdown if I even try. <laughs> so I'm not doing it. Yeah, th- that's um, that that's definitely where I was. I relate to that completely. It, even with um, because you know, like later on, I think I kind of set a path for myself <laughs> just because of the creativity and people, you know, kind of leaned toward that and they liked, I guess, that quality in me. But I was still kind of a late bloomer with that with pretty much anything i was good at i was kind of a late bloomer with it but early on before i i had tapped into any sort of creative power when i was maybe you know like seven seven eight years old i was uh hmm. um I, I i almost felt like i didn't have any business being at that school that that i was at mm-hmm. just because i was so not with the program i remember um well first off i would cry all the time because of the anxiety and, you know, uh, what's going to happen today that's bad? How am I going to be embarrassed? And I would cry all the time. But, like, I remember something that I would have been good at later on that I was really bad at was um, was my handwriting. Because I, I kind of like to, you know, invest, like, a little bit of uh, art flair kind of into, like, penmanship yeah. these days. And I remember mm-hmm. this was, um, I think this was second grade when we were learning cursive. And for some reason, this was a Catholic school. So for some reason, the uh, the main nun, she wanted us to write our cursive twos a certain way um, with, you know, kind of like curly cues and all kinds of things in it. Very ornate. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, I hope I haven't told the story already on the podcast, but uh, but she made me, you know, I couldn't go out for recess, which was kind of a disaster for me because I was just this ball of energy. And recess was one of the best things for me. Um, just going out and playing for a bit, then coming back and, you know, I've expelled some energy and I can focus again, but she made me stay in class while the other kids were out playing, practicing my curse of twos and oh, wow. all night she wanted me to, you know, at my house for homework, keep practicing the curse of two until I got it right. And then I, uh, it was, it took me a few days to get it. And then I went into class and she had me write it on the board in front of everybody. And I finally got it right. And people were like, you know, uh, kind of clapping, I think kind of in a mocking way, but, um, but she said she had a prize for me and I'm like, Oh, cool. I get a prize. It was a number two pencil. And she, <laughs> and so she handed it to me and, uh, I was like, you know, I was kind of playing with it. You know, I got this thing, I got this new toy now and I'm going to play with it. And so the this guy sitting next to me, his name was Stuart. He said, "Hey, let me see that," and I handed it to him. And then, 
the, the same nun who gave me that pencil looked back at me like I was cutting up in class and passing around my pencil or something. And then she took it and broke it in half right in front of me. <laughs> what? So uh, I didn't feel very incentivized to, uh, to perform and learn at that point. Um, no. That was kind of a digression, but that, that's what came to mind. <laughs> The Tourette Association of America is the premier nonprofit working to raise awareness, advance research, and provide ongoing support to those with Tourette syndrome or tic disorder. With a network of over 130 chapters, support groups, and centers of excellence, the TAA engages with communities across the nation in an effort to provide tools, webinars, workshops, and support for all seeking assistance. As a primary sponsor of Tourette's podcast, the TAA supports the authentic conversations showcasing the diverse representation of the TS community. To learn more, visit Tourette.org. T-O-U-R-E-T-T-E dot org. You know, if, if ticking, you know, isn't, isn't a huge downside for you uh, anyway, but, you know, still with the things that come with it, the anxiety and all that and the energy, what, what do you like to do to kind of manage everything and, you know, kind of feel good? I like riding my bike and that sounds like a, such a boring thing to do. No. But I, just, I like just putting my headphones on if there's music or no music and I just ride down the road or wherever I'm going, down the beach. Sometimes I'll put the noise cancelling function on so I can just hear myself breathing mm -hmm. and other times I'll just listen to all the things around me. Yeah, so that's that's nice for me to ride the bike. Um, other things I do, um, don't even know. That's I a, don't really get too much time to do other things, juggling the kids, work. Yeah, um, that's a treat though. I mean, get, getting out on your bike yeah. and just kind of, you know, just kind of feeling it and getting into your own zone. I mean, that's there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, I think we need our own time sometimes just to zone out. Clear your mind. I've been better about that lately. I think before, um, I think some of the values that I was brought up under, and this is not necessarily my family, but I think just the kind of culture that I grew up around was, um, you know, kind of taking time to yourself might be a bit selfish or, you know, or, you know, you should be lending a hand with something else. It's all, you know, like that. If you got time to lean, you got time mm -hmm. to clean. And um, I always felt guilty kind of doing my own thing. Uh, I was by myself a lot when I was a kid, but if I wasn't doing anything productive, and I guess this is maybe more my adult life, but uh, I've always had this kind of feeling of guilt that I should be doing something, uh, having something to show, you know, for the time I'm spending versus just kind of enjoying it and sitting around and, um, you know, or going out on my bike or something. I mean, it's just, it's a really essential reset I understand that, but at the same time, you need to have some time for yourself. Because mm -hmm. I, I never used to do much for myself. I was always, a, I won't say a people pleaser, but I, I'm I'm a helpful person. So I always ask people, do you want me to do anything for you? And like spend time with people. Yeah. But then the last couple of years, I thought to myself, because obviously with the kids, and I thought I need to get myself back. And then I just started having time for myself. Even if it's just watching Netflix in my bed on my own, away from everyone else, mm -hmm. it's you just really, really time on your own for yourself. Yeah, it's very important, no matter what you're doing. Even if it's just taking a bath. Yeah, yeah, that that's something I've um I've kind of recently rediscovered is uh because you know like I've had a bathtub in my house like I I just I never do anything with it. I take a shower. I'm in and out. You know, it's more of just like a functional yeah. thing, but. Uh, Ad Smith, um, who you know, the host from uh, the presenter from the Three Drinkers, who was at the uh, <laughs> the end of last season, I guess. Be, he's definitely talked me into. Um, he's like, dude, y you have to do this. Like, take a bath. Like, just make it a thing for yourself. Light some candles. You know, I never just... used to do that. I used to just have showers. Yeah, yeah. And now I, I don't care. I shut that door. And if someone knocking to go to the toilet, I don't care. You can stay out. Yeah, I'm just here. <laughs> relaxing and it's so important it's yeah it's it's like such a simple thing but it's been a huge thing for me to rediscover um just the benefits from it of just chilling out for a bit and 
you know, just kind of getting lost. It, it's made me, if I wasn't so weird about confined spaces, I feel like I would almost want to get interested in those, um, like deprivation tanks or those floating chambers just to see what that does for me. I wouldn't have been doing one of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't think I'm there That's yet. Cool, but it's a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it, it, it is true. I, um, when you said it's been the past couple of years from you, it's, it's definitely been the past couple of years for me too of, uh, I, I've been kind of a workaholic, I guess, you know, in my adult life. And, um, it's because I think partly because of insecurity, I want to make sure I'm ahead of the game and that I know what I'm doing and I'm studied up. So I'm ready for the, you know, ready for the test, so to speak. And then the other part mm-hmm. of it, sometimes work, you know, can be an escape itself, uh, from other things. Yeah. And in the past couple of years, you know, encouragement coming from all corners to you're doing too much, you know, slow down, stop it. And where it sounded just like a thing people say before, I've really taken it to heart over the past couple of years because it's easy to have a breakdown and um, burning out, you know, it sounds like something that might, you know, just last a weekend and then you can get right back to it, but it's really bad when it happens. And um, yeah. pacing myself has been one of the biggest, pacing myself and setting boundaries, the biggest things I've done for myself in the past couple of years. You need to, self-care is important because if you go down, it can last months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can take however long. Yeah. And I hope, you know, the current thing of photography, I mean, which is what I do for a living, you know, so it's not just a hobby, but the the passion side of it that I've really stepped up in the past few years. I hope that sticks with me. I hope it doesn't go away. You know, I've invested a lot in it, but at the same time, I really do get a lot out of just, you know, the, the taking time to yourself piece is kind of baked into that. It's just kind of part mm-hmm. of that plan and it's pleasurable and it's fun. But this kind of gets my head swimming into like, what's my next thing going to be? Yeah. Is it going to be, you know, I don't know. I kind of don't want to go there. <laughs> I, I want to see how much I can stretch this out. <laughs> the same with me. I, I don't know what I'll do. I don't know what's next for me. So at the moment, so I started the resin thing recently and um, it's keeping me busy. But I kind of slowed down the orders because I don't want it to feel like a job. Otherwise, that was ruin it for me so that's important at the moment i'm just taking my time doing whatever whenever i don't know even what i would do next i know i would find something but yeah i don't have to <laughs> i don't have the mental capacity to invest in anything else at the <laughs> moment yeah yeah understood but no that, that that is important to you know kind of protect your hobby by not doing it too much or not yeah exposing it too widely to where people it's nice to have people lining up to pay you for something that they think you're good at, but yeah, that, that can overwhelm and you have new expectations and measures to meet and you don't want to let people down when before it was just you doing it for yourself. And, mm-hmm. but what you do is really fantastic. Like I really like it. Thanks. Some things are a bit shocking to some. My mom's always saying to me, Oh, do you have to put some vulgar things up there? I'm like, well, that's what people ask for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't have to go into it, but um, yeah, but I, yeah, I know what you mean. But you know, demand needs supply, so yeah, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> oh, I actually met a little boy. He come into my shop. He's got correct because I was sitting there and he was just moving around, and I said to his, um, he's with his nun, and I said, has he got ADHD or anything? She's like, oh, no, he's just got to it. Don't worry about him. Huh. And she tried to give me the talk to educate me. I said, <laughs> I know, I know. Me too. And she was like, oh. She was so happy. She's, she's never met anyone else with it. And I said, me neither, not in the flesh. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I've got a new friend who's a 10-year-old. That's so cool. Yeah, it's kind of like a magic moment when that happens. It is, because obviously I speak to Miles and you and some people on Facebook. But um, to meet someone in the flesh is actually really cool. Yeah, it was, Um, I think the podcast was maybe in like the third season or something before I met anybody in the flesh um, yeah. who had Tourette, besides the people I met when I was a little kid. You know, I have some sharp memories of that. A lot of them are kind of vague, but in your adult life, you know, it's, it's, it's different. And um, I went to a support group to kind of give a little talk there and introduce myself. And it was one in this area where I live. 
And uh, it was a lot of fun. I met Kimmy uh, from one of the earlier seasons of the podcast. She was there. Um, no, there was maybe about a dozen people there, including parents. But yeah, it was just really nice and reassuring because even though if you think about the statistics of whatever it is, like one in a hundred people have Tourette, there's a million people in the country here, you know, you can still be isolated and know these figures and still feel that sense of isolation, mm-hmm. I think. And, you know, yeah. you can still feel good about it knowing communities out there. And I hope people feel good listening to the podcast, but the chance to meet somebody yeah, else. it really helped me. No, I'm really happy to hear that it did. I mean, I mean, it, it, every conversation I have on here helps me. So when I finally did get to meet somebody in my adult life, it felt like kind of like, uh, closing a certain loop, you know, it was, it felt like an accomplishment to meet somebody else and be, yeah. you know, kind of self-accepting and we can both kind of talk about it and then talk about other things that don't have anything to do with Tourette because that's out of the way, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. That, just that mutual understanding. At first, I was really nervous. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to talk to Ben. And, uh, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> but now I'm, I'm calm. Yeah, good. No, it's, uh, I mean, even we've done, what, like 100 episodes or something now. And I still get nervous before every call because, you know, uh, I don't want to make any mistakes. I don't want to say anything dumb. I, you know, and I have the power to like edit myself if I need to, if I need to cut something out for myself yeah. or, but, Still, like, I, I want to have a meaningful conversation that doesn't feel stilted or, you know, kind of racked by nerves. And it, yeah, it just softens pretty quickly once we get the conversation going. Because, you know, it's fun to talk about Tourette, but then it's also fun to kind of like, yeah, tuck that to the side and talk about other things that, you know, are important to our lives. And, and yeah, that mutual understanding, there's like a power in that. And I think it enables a better conversation because it's almost like, you know, we understand the same kind of vocabulary even though I've never met you in person mm-hmm. before. Oh, can I ask you a question, actually? Yeah. You know, when, with your Tourette, what did you, who did you have, did you have any problems with family about it, or was it just other people? How did your family accept it? My family is pretty good about it. My parents, I think, in kind of exploring this, I mean, I definitely know that I drove them nuts when I was a kid. And, um, yeah. you know, the the lack of sleep, I mean, I don't envy my parents and the role they had in bringing me up because if I wasn't sleeping, neither were they. If I wasn't happy, nobody was happy. And uh, a lot of that, just, just the frustration of being misunderstood, even when you have the answer. So like, even when I was diagnosed with Tourette, I still didn't feel like I was taken seriously. And, and I don't necessarily mean within my family, but maybe within like the larger circle around it, people in my neighborhood, um, the way they would kind of, talk down to me and, you know, just things that kind of steal your confidence. And Mm. I was really lucky to have, you know, even though I drove them nuts, uh, my parents were really patient. And, you know, once they finally got it, like once they finally got the rhythm with me and knew what was going to work and what didn't, uh, which was completely different from, I think, what traditional parenting would ask for. It was like our entire relationship changed. And um, I think I became outwardly like a nicer person and you know i just felt more comfortable and feeling more comfortable is like the ultimate you know yeah and i still have my frustrations you know with people out in the world especially teachers and you know not all of them i had some great teachers but i definitely had some who just wouldn't accept it you know i was acting up i was misbehaving and i deserve the same punishment as everybody else and maybe mm-hmm. but the way they regarded it and the way they approached the whole thing, I felt like I couldn't, if it was a teacher, you know, and you're supposed to have that, you know, uh, I'm a learning junkie. I want to learn. I definitely think educational institutions need to have education on neurodiversities because yes, they have no idea and you can tell them and your parents can tell them and they still have no idea. Yeah, it's um I mean sh- shout out to the teachers out there who are doing it well because, you know, that's a that's a special thing oh, and yeah, yeah. and that can be life-changing for a kid who has it and you know, the I specifically remember any adult when I was a kid who did seem to get me and had the right kind of patience and tone and attitude with me and seemed to give me the patience to be myself and not judge me. I specifically remember these people. 
certain friends of the family um, that I just think on really, really fondly because of that impact. And all they had to do was accept me and give me a little bit of patience. That's yeah. that, that was the whole thing. And so when teachers were kind of, you know, snapping their fingers and you got to do it my way and all that. Yeah, I, I'm a learning junkie and I love learning and I love absorbing things. And ideally kind of being in the classroom is one of the best things for me just because I, I love digging in and just immersing myself. But if it's mm -hmm. a teacher who kind of, you know, is, is so rigid that you're denied the natural way that your brain wants to learn and you have to do it this other way that just completely doesn't speak to you, it's, it's, it feels like a robbed opportunity and it takes your confidence away because you don't feel like you're with the program. Yeah. And that's certainly how I felt. Yeah, same. I think that ruins a lot of my childhood, actually, is school. Yeah. And just Yeah, they wasn't understanding. But then I didn't have a name for it. But mm. at that age, I wish I did. Well, yeah, I mean, that... But the reason I asked you about family as well, because my family was not um, understanding at all, apart from my stepmom. My dad, he's obviously, he's Jamaican, so... Mm -hmm. I don't know. He, yeah, Jamaican do not like to admit when they about their children. It's really not good when your family don't support it. And I think every someone, if you've got someone you know who's a bit different, you need to learn to understand them or try your best to be understanding. Because for me, it made me feel really uncomfortable. I felt like my family didn't like me my brother used to mock me all the time um and that made me be really defensive i think mm -hmm. to a point that was good for me because because i've always been defensive because i thought i've got to have my back because no one else has thanks for listening thanks to becky for hanging out Late night for her, she's five hours ahead of me in her time zone. Thanks, Beck. I'll have links to her and her work with this episode at Tourette'spodcast.com. Thanks to executive producers like Brett, Jerry, Ramona, and the latest being Scholastic Tourette supporters at scholasticsupport.org, taking applications now for scholarships for students with Tourette syndrome. Again, scholasticsupport.org. You can support the podcast at patreon.com slash Podcast. If this podcast benefits you, whether it's companionship or answers or confirmations or affirmations, or just the relatability of hearing people talk about an experience that you're exploring for yourself, patreon.com slash Tourette's podcast. Of course, the primary sponsor is the Tourette Association of America. They make it possible. They're online at Tourette.org. They're the largest advocacy group for the Tourette and tick disorder community, doing all kinds of work thanks to the support you give them. Tourette.org. Shout out to the other Tourette groups like Tourette's Action in the UK and Tourette Canada, of course, and Neurodiverse.org and the Tourette Syndrome Association of Australia and Camp Twitch and Shout and so on. There's a lot of support, including the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook, which Sophia has made into a really thriving community unto itself. Tell her thank you so much for that. All right, hope you've had a good week. I'll be in touch. Tourette'spodcast at gmail.com or the contact form at Tourette'sPodcast.com. I read everything that comes in. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you again soon. This is Ben. <laughs>